This video introduces functions and their domains and ranges. A function is a correspondence between input numbers, usually the x values, and output numbers, usually the y values, that sends each input number to exactly one output number. Sometimes a function is thought of as a rule or machine in which you can feed in x values as input and get out y values as output. So a non-mathematical example of a function might be the biological mother function, which takes as input any person and gives as output their biological mother. This function satisfies the condition that each input number or object, person in this case, uh, gets sent to exactly one output person because if you take any person, they just have one biological mother. So that rule does give you a function, but if I change things around and just use the, the mother function, which sends to each person their mother, that's no longer going to be a function because there are some people who have more than one mother, right? They could have a biological mother and adopted mother or, or a mother and a stepmother or any number of situations. So since there's, there's so, at least some people who you would put it as input and then you'd get like more than one possible output, that violates this, this rule of functions. It, it would not be a function. Now, most of the time, we'll work with functions that are described with equations, not in terms of mothers. So, for example, we could have the function y equals x squared plus 1. This can also be written as f of x equals x squared plus 1. Here, f of x is function notation that stands for the output value of y. Notice that this notation is not representing multiplication. We're not multiplying f by x. Instead, we're going to be putting in a value for x as input and getting out a value of f of x or y. For example, if we want to evaluate f of 2, we're plugging in 2 as input for x, either in this equation or in that equation, since f of 2 means 2 squared plus 1, f of 2 is going to equal 5. Similarly, f of 5 means I plug in 5 for x, so that's going to be 5 squared plus 1, or 26. Sometimes it's useful to evaluate a function on a more complicated expression involving other variables. In this case, remember, the function's value on any expression is just when you, what you get when you plug in that whole expression for x. So f of a plus 3 is going to be the quantity a plus 3 squared plus 1. We could rewrite that as a squared plus 6a plus 9 plus 1, or a squared plus 6a plus 10. When evaluating a function on a complex expression, it's important to keep the parentheses when you plug in for x. That way, you evaluate the function on the whole expression. For example, it would be wrong to write f of a plus 3 equals a plus 3 squared plus 1 without the parentheses, because that would imply we were just squaring the 3 and, and not the whole expression a plus 3. Sometimes a function is described with a graph instead of an equation. In this example, this graph is supposed to represent the function g of x. Not all graphs actually represent functions. For example, the graph of a circle doesn't represent a function. That's because the graph of a circle violates the vertical line test. You can draw a vertical line and it'll intersect the graph in more than one point. But our graph at left satisfies the vertical line test. Any vertical line intersects the graph in at most one point. That means it's a function because every x value will have at most one y value that corresponds to it. Let's evaluate g of 2. Note that 2 is an x value, and we'll use the graph to find the corresponding y value. So I look for 2 on the x-axis and find the point on the graph that has that x value. It's right here. Now I can look at the y value of that point, looks like 3, and therefore g of 2 is equal to 3. If I try to do the same thing to evaluate g of 5, I run into trouble 
5 is an x value, I look for it on the x-axis, but there's no point on the graph that has that x value. Therefore, g of 5 is undefined, or we can say it does not exist. The question of what x values and y values make sense for a function leads us to a discussion of domain and range. The domain of a function is all possible x values that make sense for that function. The range is the y values that make sense for the function. In this example, we saw that the x value of 5 didn't have a corresponding y value for this function. So the x value of 5 is not in the domain of our function g. To find the x values in the domain, we have to look at the x values that correspond to points on the graph. One way to do that is to take the shadow or projection of the graph onto the x-axis and see what x values are hit. It looks like we're hitting all x values starting at negative 8 and continuing up to 4. So our domain is the x's between negative 8 and 4, including those endpoints. Or we can write this in interval notation as negative 8 comma 4 with square brackets. To find the range of the function, we look for the y values corresponding to points on this graph. We can do that by taking the shadow or projection of the graph onto the y-axis. We seem to be hitting all y values from negative 5 up through 3. So our range is y's between negative 5 and 3, or an interval notation, negative 5, 3, with square brackets. If we meet a function that's described as an equation instead of a graph, one way to find the domain and range are to graph the function. But it's often possible to find the domain, at least, more quickly by using algebraic considerations. We think about what x values it makes sense to plug into this expression and what x values need to be excluded because they make the algebraic expression impossible to evaluate. Specifically, to find the domain of a function, we need to exclude x values that make the denominator 0, since we can't divide by 0. We also need to exclude x values that make an expression inside a square root sign negative, since we can't take the square root of a negative number. In fact, we need to exclude values that make an expression inside any even root negative, because we can't take an even root of a negative number, even though we can take an odd root, like a cube root of a negative number. Later, when we look at logarithmic functions, we'll have some additional exclusions that we have to make. But for now, these two principles should handle all functions we'll see. So let's apply them to a couple examples. For the function in part a, we don't have any square root signs, but we do have a denominator. So we need to exclude x values that make the denominator 0. In other words, we need x squared minus 4x plus 3 to not be equal to 0. If we solve x squared minus 4x plus 3 equal to 0, we can do that by factoring. And that gives us x equals 3 or x equals 1. So we need to exclude these values. All other x values should be fine, so if I draw the number line, I can put on 1 and 3 and just dig out a hole at both of those, and my domain includes everything else on the number line. In interval notation, this means my domain is everything from negative infinity to 1 together with everything from 1 to 3 together with everything from 3 to infinity. In this second example, we don't have any denominators to worry about, but we do have a square root sign. So we need to exclude any x values that make 3 minus 2x less than 0. In other words, we can include all x values for which 3 minus 2x is greater than or equal to 0. Solving that inequality gives us 3 is greater than or equal to 2x. In other words, x is less than or equal to 3 halves. I can draw this on the number line or write it in interval notation. Notice that 3 halves is included, and that's because 3 minus 2x is allowed to be 0. I can take the square root of 0. It's just 0, and that's not a problem.
Finally, let's look at a more complicated function that involves both a square root and a denominator. Now there are two things I need to worry about. I need the denominator to not be equal to zero, and I need the stuff inside the square root sign to be greater than or equal to zero. From our earlier work, we know that the first condition means that x is not equal to three and x is not equal to one. And the second condition means that x is less than or equal to three halves. Let's draw both of those conditions on the number line. x is not equal to three and x is not equal to one means we've got everything except those two dug out points. And the other condition, x is less than or equal to three halves, means we can have three halves and everything to the left of it. Now to be in our domain and to be legit for our function, we need both of these conditions to be true. So I'm gonna connect these conditions with an and. And that means we're looking for numbers on the number line that are colored both red and blue. So I'll, I'll draw that above in purple. So that's everything from three halves to one. I have to dig out one because one was a problem for the denominator. And then I can continue for all the things that are colored both, both colors, red and blue. So my final domain is going to be, let's see, negative infinity up to, but not including one, together with one, but not including it, to three halves. And I include three halves since that was colored both red and blue also. In this video, we talked about functions, how to evaluate them, and how to find domains and ranges.